what's the greatest advice you've ever received? It's from my mother. And it's two words, keep moving. That's what she said, Cindy, just keep moving. So I, whenever I get down, I go, oh, I can't do this. I hear my mother go, keep moving. Wow. And so I move and it works on so many different levels. I like that. Tell me about me, myself, and Shirley. Is this kind of like a, a living memoir, this show, for you? Well, that sounds a little serious, <laughs> a living memoir. But yes, yeah, you're right, it is. It's, um, it's a fun living memoir. And uh, it's just, it's a lot of stories, a lot of fun stories that I've had the blessing, you know, I to be in show business and to meet a lot of fabulous people and have a lot of fabulous adventures. So that's kind of what it's uh, about. We trot along like that. And then I get into Laverne and Shirley and I have <laughs> some wonderful fun stuff. I wanted to do this show to make people laugh, you know, and myself and have some fun in this day and age, if you will, Allison. Yeah. I think that, for instance, I've done the show before, but it was in a different version. And people, a lot of the comments that were made were, well, what about your childhood? And what about, you know, your early years? And I really didn't want to do that, but people were curious. So I yeah. said, well, if I can do it in a song quickly, I'll do all that exposition and all that stuff about my childhood and, you know, up to when I was 18. So I did. Okay. And so it's in a song in the show that the audience could sing along with. That's awesome. So when are you, I have to ask, because I live in South Florida, when are you bringing the show down here? Where are you? I'm in Palm Beach County. So I'm oh. near Boca. I'm near West Palm Beach. I did the show in Boca at the Wick. Yeah. You already did it? Yes, I did it at the Wick Theater, but it was a different ver. It wasn't that it was a different version. It was just the first time out because we wrote it during COVID. And so it was just, you know, three weeks at the Wick. And it's a little different now. It's, it's cut down and it's got a few shiny bells and whistles on it and just really trots along, like I said. But we've been there, but maybe next year we'll be back. You know what? I love going to, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, in West Palm Beach in City Place, the Kravis oh, Center. the Jupiter Theater? No, the Kravis Center oh, in, no, uh, in West Palm that. Beach. Oh my God. I saw actually a one woman show, George Carlin's daughter did a one woman show about her life growing up with her dad and she wow. put it on in West Palm Beach at the Kravis Center. And it was such a great venue for a one woman show. Wow. That's Just food great. for thought. Yeah. Wow. The Kravis Center. I'll remember that. Yeah. You know what else is so cool is when I was telling people that I was going to be interviewing you, there were so many people that I did not expect that were fans of yours. Like a lot of men that were like in their forties and they're like, oh man, I, that was one of my favorite shows, Laverne and Shirley, like people that you would never in a million years know would be fans of the show. Really? What a yeah. Compliment. Yeah. Um, well, we had a lot of closet viewers, you know, people didn't want to admit <laughs> that, they, that they love Laverne and Shirley. And it was a lot of people in show business, but you know who loved Laverne and Shirley right out of the box that kind of surprised me were rock and rollers, like bands. Uh, like we had the E Street band come down one time and, you know, the crew came down and watched rehearsals and uh, that's Bruce Springsteen and uh, yeah. just a bunch of other rock and roll. so funny. I loved it because in its own way, it was very hip, but it was mm -hmm. very um, mild. And I talk about this in the show because in those days we had censors were assigned to each show, especially okay. in family hour, which we were a part of. So they didn't let us get away with, you know, diddly squat. And in fact, we couldn't say diddly squat on the show. <laughs> we had a born again, Christian uh, center, great guy, but he just wouldn't let us say things. So it made the show better, Allison. And so we couldn't just, re you know, refer to like saucy humor all the time. We had to be, it was like, a risque church camp humor. 
And yeah. uh, so we just substitute things like Vodio dough for, you know, going all the way because we couldn't say it on the show. And so it was like Vodio dough, you vodeo and <laughs> things like that. And so it became a show that was hip in one respect and also hip for children. Children could watch it because there'd be innuendos and, you know, and certain things that we do. But it would also apply for children because there were no words spoken or anything. There would just maybe be an attitude of, hmm, yeah. Right, like innuendo, and, yeah. to be creative, you know, yeah. Right. right, and so it made the show better. We always thought that our Christian born-again censor made Laverne and Shirley funnier. That is so funny. Because it was all clean humor. You know, it's all clean, which everybody really enjoys, whether they know it or not. Anyway, you know, you know what? You're right. And there was an art to the sitcom back in those days, I think. It was was like the golden age of television in a lot of ways. I never thought of it that way, but you're right in the sense that we performed it in front of an audience and we ran it like a play Mm -hmm. because we wanted our audience to see the entire show. Because that way they we travel along all together and get the joke. And the, yeah. the rhythm would be, you know, and everybody is like a little football game, kind of. So we started at the top and we ran the entire show all the way through to the end without really going back. I mean, we never cut it up and did scenes. We're going to do the third scene at the beginning for the audience. You ran through the you ran through the whole thing live, like start to finish in front of the and audience. That's rhythm, and that's why the soundtrack of the audience laughing, which is the real soundtrack of the show, is real and in the right energy, and that really helped it. You know, I mean, it just made it a whole wonderful, fun half an hour, but it. You know, it still took two hours to shoot it, but we ran. So the audience was with us. So they got the whole joke all the way through. They We weren't That's depending awesome. on just little side jokes. It was the attitude and the joke of the characters and the play in it. They got the play. And we wanted, Lucille Ball did it like that, I believe. And we had her crew. Did um, you really? Yeah. From, from I Love Lucy? Yeah. Desi Arnaz had invented, because Lucy was a physical comedian, so she was all over the stage. So Desi Arnaz, in his genius, put the cameras on these dollies. So there's three cameras. You've got the stage, like you're watching mm-hmm. a play, you're in the audience, and you've got the cameras moving. And because we moved like that, they move with us. They're on dollies. Usually cameras are set and they're stagnant. You know, they're just sitting there. But our cameras were like Lucille Ball's cameras on the Lucy show. Uh, They were on dollies and they moved with us. Was it to capture the the physicality, (laughs) the physical humor? Exactly. And that was Desi Arnaz who did that. Wow. Yeah. And when you guys spun off of Happy Days, What was that like? So when you were shooting the pilot and even when you were into the first season, was it a lot of pressure to live up to the success of Happy Days or what was the atmosphere? Penny, I talk about this in my show. We were writing something together. We had been assigned as writing partners on this movie. You and Penny Marshall. Me and Penny Marshall, yes. And so we were working together and then we got a call in our office from Gary Marshall asking if we, he said there were these parts of these two girls on happy days and their Fonzie goes on a double date with Richie and they're friends of Fonzie's Laverne and Shirley. And he said, they're girls who date the fleet. (laughs) So Penny and I thought, "Hmm, hookers, this'll be fun. (laughs) And, And so he asked us if we could take time off from our little writing assignment to go over to Paramount and shoot this for a week. And we said, sure. And we went over, we did the show. We had a lot of fun. We went back to our writing. And two weeks later, we got a call from Gary's office. It said ABC had seen the episode and they loved it. And they wanted to spin the characters off. Well, at that time, Penny and I had no idea what that meant. It had explained to us, you get your own show. So Penny and I thought, 
said our own show. What does that mean? Our own show. <laughs> so then it just started rolling like that. <laughs> Before we knew it, we were doing other episodes on Happy Days to introduce the characters. And then yeah. we call what they call crossovers, where mm -hmm. you have the characters on Happy Days and then you you know, the storyline goes over to Laverne and Shirley. And that's how it came about. And it happened so fast. Penny and I had no time to go, wow, this is really happening. And we never really took it seriously. You know, I mean, we just, the first time the show aired, Gary came down and showed us the numbers. That's what they call it. The overnights, you know, that's yeah. how many people watch the show. And they were like, you know, he showed us this and he was so happy and elated. And it was like, you know, 36 million people. Or Which you could get like in those that. days. I, I yeah, yeah. Up, but it was like so many millions of people. Right. And Penny and I absolutely went right over our head. Neither one of us are good with numbers. It went right over our head. We did not understand the meaning of that as far as it, it was wow. applied to TV. And... Um, were you coming from a theater background at first? Yes, I was. And what was Penny's background? In college, she was, her major was athletics. And she was really interested. I guess she was going to teach, you know, PE. That worked perfectly. Plus, she's a, just a natural entertainer. You know, she's a natural performer. But I went to theater arts college at Los Angeles City College. A rigorous program. They touch everything about theater. I could do anything in theater. I knew everything about the stage, nothing about films and television, which was ironic because I lived in Hollywood and I wanted to yeah. work in film and television. Here's an interesting thing. Later on in Laverne and Shirley, we had film actors come on and they played little parts for fun, but they were thrown by the audience. They were thrown by having, you know, cause they were used to up close in person. Right, sure. And which I knew nothing about. And Penny and I, we couldn't understand it for a while until we did understand it, that it was, they were thrown by the audience, by there being, you know, over 200 people there and by this big set, because we shot like Lucy and proscenium, but we had mm -hmm. cameras, you know, for close-ups, close-ups, and then the proscenium camera there. Anyway, I've forgotten. I lost the thread. Did they, the, I guess, movie stars that came on, did they get stage fright? Yeah. If they had yeah. been trained in theater, I won't name who, but there were some okay. that were thrown by it. Wow. Like wonderful, wonderful actors. Yeah. By it. Yeah. Gary Marshall was the creator or one of the creators of the show? He was the creator. He was the creator. Lowell Gans and Mark Rothman. You know, I know Lowell Gans. He's, um, he grew up with a family friend of mine. And uh, when I first started writing in the early, I was in print for 15 years. Wow. Print interviews. Wow. And he was like a friend of a family friend. And he was gracious enough to look at a lot of my work, like in the early days and take time out of his day to like help me and give me advice. He's a genius. Yeah. A genius. He, he just, really, really is. Yeah. Really. And such a great guy. Yes. Yes, he is. What was it like working with a brother-sister duo? Like the, the dynamic with Gary and Penny, the fact that they were siblings. I mean, what was that like on the set? Well, I never thought of them as, here comes that brother and sister duo. <laughs> I just, they were Gary and Penny. And then their father, Tony, was one of mm -hmm. the producers. And their sister, Ronnie, was another one. And all the cousins came, but... That didn't leave me and my family out. They have my mother on the show, my sister on the show. Oh, you really? Know, it was, they're very familial. And that's one of the reasons that Laverne and Shirley worked so well is mm -hmm. because we're familial. And we go, oh, my mother's coming. All right, come on, come on, come on. And so it was an attitude of family. Even if there weren't any, wasn't any family on the show, it was the attitude of family. I mean, we were all very familiar with each other. You know, I mean like a family. And I didn't know that you and Penny had a backstory before the show, which is really interesting. I figured that you just met when you both got the job on the show. No, okay. I think we got the job on the show. I'm just surmising here and I never asked Gary, but I think he was thinking, oh, Penny and Cindy are right. Cause I knew Gary before. 
Penny and Cindy are writing together. Hmm, these two characters, Laverne and Shirley. I think that's right. in my imagine. I never asked Gary that, but that's what I'm thinking in my imagination, that that's what happened. But I do know that when Mark and Lowell and Gary were writing one particular show, they said, what do we name the girls? And I think uh, Lowell said Laverne and then Mark said, and Shirley. That's it's how so they're perfect. They're yeah. Writing partners. Isn't that fun? Yeah. It's so perfect. I want to talk about the theme song for the opening credits. Uh-huh. Do you know the song by heart? Are you talking about Shlemiel Shlemazel? Shlemiel Shlemazel. Yeah. That's how it starts. The theme song. Yeah. No, I didn't know it. I talk about this in my show. We were shooting, Gary shot the opening credits to the show. Mm -hmm. And it was at the end of the day. And we were on the Paramount lot on this thing called New York Street, which is, it looks like New York. We were losing the light and Gary yelled to Penny. He said, Penny, teach Cindy that little thing you girls, you and your friends did to count the steps to school. And so she taught me one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Shlemiel, kick out, Shlemazel, and Haas and Pfeffer Incorporated, you go up and I go down. Mm -hmm. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. And she goes, just do it. So I, we did it twice and that was it. So when you shot that, it was like right off the cuff. Yeah. She taught it to me really quickly. Right. And I think I went up the wrong way. She said, no, one of us goes up and one of us goes, you know, it's like this. Yeah. And I couldn't get it. And then they explained to me later what Shlemiel Shlemazel. It's, it's a Yiddish. miracle I could pronounce it then. A Shlemiel is a person who jumps out of a window for no particular reason. And a <laughs> Shlemazel is a person they land on. So it's like dumb and dumb. I mean, that's okay. a- part of the show. I explained Shlemiel Shlemazel. So was the Yiddish at the beginning, was it just something oh, yeah, that- Yiddish. It's Yiddish, right? It was just yeah. something that Gary came up with or it was- No, no. That- it was a little song that Penny, when, all right, imagine we're in grade school, right? And we're going to walk to school together. Well, this is what the kids on her block did. The girls, they linked arms Right. And they counted off the steps to school and they go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Shlemiel, Shlemazel, Haas and Pfeffer Incorporated. Then they run. Then okay. They run I didn't know they did the Yiddish part with the steps. Okay. I get it now. Yeah. Interesting. But this song, it's <laughs> so funny. The song like speaks to my soul. The words in the song. Do it in it? my uh, way. Give us any chance, we'll take okay. it. Give us any uh, read we'll us any it. rule, we'll break it. I love yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna make love our it. dreams come to a lot of people, you know, resounded for a lot of people. Yeah, love it. I wanted to ask you because I did read in your bio that you had to overcome a challenging childhood. What was the defining aspect of your childhood that maybe perhaps made you want to go into? theater made you want to go into comedy? Well, I come from a very funny family and uh, my father was funniest man I ever knew. Always hijinks and, you know, he'd tell us a story about the werewolf, me and my sister, you know, it's okay, it's time for bed. (laughs) And so we'd be laying there and he'd sneak out of the house and go and scratch on our bedroom window and howl. Anyway, he was very, he was very funny, but he also drank. He was an alcoholic. And uh, when he drank, he was another person. He wasn't so funny. You know, I kind of had to pilot my way through my childhood because my mother worked at night and my father worked during the day and he'd come home and he'd start drinking and then he'd want to go to the bars and he'd take me with him from the time I was a little girl and he'd lock me in the car and he'd go in and drink and I remember this is irony I'd see this sign flashing on a schlitz 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 and I thought of that with shots you know I thought oh my god anyway When I got older, I wanted to, you know, after my, when I was in high school, I wanted to be a nurse, but I didn't have an academic brain. I don't have an academic brain. I just don't. And Mm -hmm. so I flunked biology twice and had to take it in summer school. And I thought, who wants a nurse who has flunked biology? You know, I'd have a, a good bedside demeanor, but I wouldn't, 
I read the charts and go, I don't know what the heck I'm supposed to be giving them now. So, <laughs> but around that time in high school, there was auditions for a talent show for the high school talent show, which I auditioned and I did a Bob Newhart monologue where he's the driving instructor. Anyway, I got into the talent show and the drama teacher, you know, he was the one coordinating the talent show. He said, well, yes, you're in the talent show and I'd like to invite you to come into play production so you can skip drama one and two and come directly into play production. He said, if you have a, you know, an empty space next year in your program and so I an elective so I took it as an elective I went into play production I, my play production class also included Sally Field who was doing the flying nun and I was so jealous and you went uh, to high school together yeah was it Van Nuys no Birmingham Birmingham, Birmingham. High. okay and um and she was brilliant even at the age of 14 15 brilliant on stage and uh, everybody recognized it. But anyway, the bug bit and I just loved theater. And so then I went from there to Los Angeles City College and joined the, entered in the theater arts program there, which was rigorous, but they trained you. And that's the story of that. Okay. And what parts of Shirley Feeney came from you, from Cindy, and what parts had to be filled in for that character? Well, I always think of situation comedies as personality plays, because whether you believe it or not, the writers watch it. You're playing a character, but then they write toward your strong suits and mm -hmm. sometimes toward your weaknesses through the character. So there was a lot of me in there. Like I can be, I wouldn't call it passive aggressive. <laughs> But I can be very <laughs> calm. And then if something just people push me too far, I'll turn and I'll go Sicilian on them, which I'm okay. half Sicilian. So they started writing that for Shirley, where she would be very sweet and calm. And then she'd scream at somebody. But it was very funny. And I love that turn that they would have the character do. But they would write toward Penny Strong suits. Mm -hmm. And the boys wrote for themselves. So... I don't know what was going on there, but that was just brilliance, just pure, you know, brilliant. Oh, they were writers on, like, was it Michael McKeon? And David Lander. And they wrote, they were writers on the show? Yeah. Well, they played those characters of Lenny and Squiggy. The writers would write, who were geniuses, would write right. for them. Then they'd go in and fix it, you know, or- That's or amazing. Shows. Yeah. Those were characters they did in college at the School for the Performing Arts. Oh, wow. Um, and they were friends then, and they started performing together, and those were two characters they did. And it was Leonard Kosnowski and Anthony Squigmon. So they brought those characters into the show through Gary and Penny who had seen them perform. And he said, we need guys, we need friends, neighbors who are lower than you two. And so they got Lenny and Squeaky. Lower than working at a bottle factory. Wait, what did they do? No, they drove the truck. They drove the truck. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, as I say in my show, it, sometimes it takes a genius to play an idiot. And they're absolutely genius, both of them. How do you process the fact that a lot of the people who worked on the show have since passed away? What does that feel like? Who just passed away recently? Eddie, Eddie Mecca. Yeah. Carmine. That's a tough one. I haven't processed any of it. I haven't processed Penny passing. Mm -hmm. I still talk to her. I still think, oh, I'm going to go over there and tell her this. And, you know, Phil and Betty, I still see them as present. I know they're not, but I still see them and relate to them as present. And I have on my mantle now, when Eddie passed, I put the cast picture, I framed it and I have candles lit. And I was looking at oh. them all and I was thinking, hmm, you're gone and you're, and I could hear them laughing and going, check, check, check. <laughs> and, and then I realized it's just Michael and me. And I felt like calling him saying, I'll race you. I'll race oh, you to no. the finish line. <laughs> to the finish line. <laughs> so that's really the only way I can process it. It's my friend 
Fred Fox Jr. said it best because he worked on the show and he and I went to high school together and he was a writer on Laverne and Shirley and he called and he said, it's just surreal to me. And that's what it's like in another land. But I know they're happy because I believe in heaven and I believe oh, absolutely. in heaven and they're having fun together. Yeah, and, absolutely. You know, my, Michael and I are the odd men out right now. Yeah, that's kind of how I look at it too. And I wanted to actually ask you some spiritual questions pertaining to that. First of all, do you pray? Is praying a part of your life? And if so, who or what do you pray to? Well, is there anything or anyone to pray to other than God? Um, you would be surprised. Oh, that's, okay. that's all I'm so that's say. Not then. That's anyway, I'm with God all day, you right. know, and I remember one time standing Bex and this joke just didn't work and it didn't work and I tried and tried and I turned to Penny and I said maybe Jesus can make this joke work but I'm constantly in that frame of mind even when I'm throwing hissy fits I'm in the frame of mind of God I'm in the presence of God and God is in my presence and that or otherwise I wouldn't make it through to calm me down and to know that all things everything's well and good and that this universe is built on love. People who are afraid of God or Christ, they're fearful because they see him as the God of all, the great punisher, you right. know, and fear God. But it's not, it's love God. And God, it's unconditional love in the universe. With that comes great humor. And when you take the humor out of a society, you take a lot of love out of the society. That's just what I think is happening now, just my own personal, you know, I think a lot of that is happening because you can't, there weren't, I looked at Laverne while, I, when I was looking for little pieces of the show, I was watching Laverne and Shirley and which mm -hmm. Penny and I never did much because we shot on the night. We shot the show on the night it aired. So we tape it, you know, I mean, for ourselves to run later, sometimes we didn't. And there's a lot of shows we didn't see. And there were only two things I found. And I watched all the old episodes that couldn't be done today, you know, off the cuff. And I said, well, we would have scratched that. But only two things. Okay. Two things that could have hurt people's feelings, you know. But they would have been, if it was today, Penny and I would have caught those immediately and substituted it for something else. But that that's it. And I just because the humor we had was just a universal humor. The joke was always on us. Right. And we made sure the joke was always on us and we didn't hurt other people's feelings. We had a few fat jokes on the show, which I get hurt by today. <laughs> I'm so fat. Oh. But, um, <laughs> but we wouldn't have done those jokes today. I mean, that's right. an example. We wouldn't want to hurt people's feelings. I mean, unless the joke was on us and everybody could laugh at us and with us. That's what the show was all about. I get that. I get that. Uh, but I do feel like in some ways, a lot of the sitcom content of the 70s and 80s, there was stuff that you could never put on today, but it did help to facilitate conversations in people's homes. So I guess nowadays they have to try to find other ways to do that. I mean, if you look at shows like the Jeffersons are all in the family or certain shows like that, those shows I think would never fly today. That would just be so stupid because they're obviously making jokes about themselves. The joke is on the character. How stupid is right. the character? And you need that, as you say, Allison, to facilitate a conversation. Right. Everybody laugh at it. How ridiculous ridiculous it is for some right. prejudice or this or that and that's that's what that show was all about was to take those prejudices shine a light on them mm -hmm. and everybody step back and go that's not right but isn't he stupid and funny yeah and that's what they don't get today that they don't allow shows to be today when they're doing parodies or sending something up and or sending the character up it's not allowed it's not allowed with stand-up comics mm -hmm. and and it's a shame because then everything becomes just a flat line because like no, you said no joke there, there's just no bounciness to life anymore because right. they're so serious and watching their back 
and afraid yeah. <laughs> to say something or that person says something. I forget what it was the other day, but I wish I could remember because it was nothing, you know, but I thought, mm, I better not say that. I think there is an art to all of us being able to laugh at ourselves, but I think now that there's the pendulum has swung the other way, we're going to have to all collectively find a way to, to bring something back to center so that people can still use humor yeah. in a free way to be able to, it's like what you said, it, it comes to, to laugh. laugh. To but laugh. you see, Allison, there's a whole generation of children that are going to miss that. Yeah. It's all going to be so correct that there's nothing, you can't say, gee, I'm in a pickle anymore. What about the pickle? What do you mean by that? You're in a pickle. <laughs> What's wrong with pickles? Why do pickles <laughs> represent being in a bad situation? Yeah. You know, the pickle industry may come out. And get <laughs> so I, I'm not kidding with that. Think about what you can say. And it was something like that the other day. Gee, I'm in a pickle. Can I say that? But it wasn't pickle. Those old fashioned things you can't say anymore. Why? Because we taught this generation of children to not have a sense of self-humor. If you lose your sense of humor about yourself and situations, you if you can't laugh at situations you get yourself into, that pickle you get yourself into, then you're constantly going to be depressed and serious and depressed. And that's, I think, what's happening without using any specifics. Very smart. What do you think you came into this life as Cindy Williams to learn? And what do you think you came here into this life at this time in history to teach? That's a very spiritual question. I believe that God, everyone has a mission and everyone has something that God has imbued in them that is a talent or something. And they know it. I asked Kathy Rigby, you know, she is the famous gymnast at the Olympics. Anyway, I know the name. I know the name. She's an Olympic winner. Anyway, I asked her, I said, when did you know that you could do those triple? Did you feel it as a child? And she said, yes, she felt it in her body. That's the gift God gave her. And like, I wasn't meant to be a nurse. I was meant to do exactly what I did. That was my service. That's what God sent me here to do. That's why he didn't give me an academic brain because I would have been a nurse. I, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I would have gone into the medical profession, but he made me not too smart in biology and also faint at the sight of blood. <laughs> um, I honestly believe that God steered me. Interesting. You know, no, 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 he cha- he, no, no, no like a sheepdog. No, Mm -hmm. no, no. Rustled me up and sent me that way. I think that that was my mission to make people laugh. And I was born into a funny family. You know, I mean, they were just naturally funny people. I mean, verbose funny people. And I believe that what I'm here to learn after all this time is patience and not to take every, uh, because I take things seriously, you know, not to take everything to heart, you know, to just practice what I preach and, Mm -hmm. you know, and just say, no, that's going to be all right. Calm down. That's going to be all right. And to be able to impart that to my children, which I do, you know, everything will be fine. Wait 24 hours because I'm not a patient person. I love people, but I can, I can be patient up to a point. And this goes for, for with myself too. And so I think that's, you know, that's what I'm learning is patience, patience, prudence, and to wait and know, and also practice that faith that if you're patient, you know, all things come to those who wait. It's faith also, Allison, the faith that God's going to take care of this and, you Mm -hmm. know, everything will be well, even in the midst of everything of chaos and everything in my life seeming to fall apart. Mm -hmm. I, I always knew that had faith. It's like Indiana Jones when he, you know, steps out into the abyss. Remember that scene? And he has the faith of the knights and he steps and a stone comes up. He has faith. I haven't seen it, but that sounds oh, magical. Yeah. I have not seen it. My son yeah, has. You've got to see it. This is the cup of a carpenter. There's all these beautiful chalices imbued with jewels. He reaches back and he says, no, this is the cup of a carpenter and it's a wooden chalice because he's looking for Christ 
it's the holy grail so the next step of the templar the next test is there's an abyss that just you can't even see the bottom and he's to step out into it and have faith wow and he does and a stone comes up wow so that's what i'm looking for in my life the faith of indiana jones and what's the greatest of it it's a great I, I will i will i will yeah i'm i'm like so girly when it comes to movies i am the queen of watching chick flicks it's oh ridiculous. really oh maybe you'll give me a list because i just watched serendipity did you ever see that i saw serendipity yeah i love movies about relationships and personal evolution well, you should have a list on your show and you should you should read that list off every week and give people tips on what movies to watch Especially maybe now. yeah do it yeah what's the greatest advice you've ever received it's from my mother and it's two words keep moving that's what she said cindy just keep moving so I, whenever i get down i go oh, i can't do this i hear my mother go keep moving wow and so i move and it works on so many different levels i like that i'm going to take that for myself. So before I let you go, I just want to kind of, I don't want like to give too many spoilers away, but kind of walk me through the one woman show. When people come to see the show, what can they expect? I mean, it's, it's musical, it's comedy. And it's, it, you said you do kind of go a little bit through childhood and then you go, is it mostly the Laverne and Shirley years? The first half is just me before I was 18. And then things that I did in my career that weren't Laverne and Shirley that led up to Laverne and Shirley. Then it gets into Laverne and Shirley. But like I, you know, I auditioned for Princess Leia and I show that audition tape and um, it's just fun stuff. It's just come prepared to laugh out loud. And there is a Q and A at the end, which I thought, why do I have to do a Q and A? But the audience seems to love it. And that's yeah. very Laverne and Shirley-esque, my audience, you know, our audience would just love to ask questions. So it just come prepared to have fun and laugh. Okay. Well, hopefully, like I said, hopefully there'll be another incarnation that will circle back. Yeah, we'll here. circle back around and catch you on the second time, Allison. Okay, cool. <laughs> it was so lovely to meet you and thank you so much. You too and thank you so much, Allison. And you be well and have fun.